The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. What's up, Datables? Welcome to our season finale of the Datable Podcast for season 13. We've had quite a run for this season, and I can't believe we're already at the end of this season, but it doesn't mean that's the end of our podcast. It just means, you know, we go in season, so we get a little break for ourselves, and then we ramp back up again. Uh, this is not a goodbye. It's just a more of a see you, <laughs> see you next year. This episode is the perfect way to tie up this season, which we we're talking about breakups. But beyond all of that is how do you close the door, find a finale mm-hmm. to a previous mm-hmm. relationship, and then move forward from there. I think that's the more important mm-hmm. part is, yes, we want to be compassionate about the ending of relationships. But then how do you propel yourself forward and find your person? So this is where we're at. I think this is a perfect episode for anyone that's in the thick of it. And apparently this is breakup season right now from Christmas to Mm. Valentine's Day. Guess that's when shit hits the fan. You spend uh, too much time with families. Maybe there's this like looming gift giving that's around the corner. I'm just relaying the facts. Apparently, this is the biggest time. But it's also new year, new me. So maybe it's a lot of people that are, you know, ready to start fresh. So for anyone that's in the thick of a breakup, I think this is a fantastic episode. But even if you're not, one of the things that UA and I've learned from talking to all the people in our Finding Your Person program and just our community at large, a lot of time breakups do hold us back. Mm -hmm. Maybe you think you're over your ex, but I think what we see a lot is this fear that creeps in, a fear of getting hurt again, a fear of making the same mistakes. And all of that is sometimes buried very deep. And we've had to see that we pull out like four layers before we actually get to that being the real root cause of it's it's not the data gaps. It's not, you know, the surface level things. It's usually something much deeper. So I think this episode is a phenomenal way to maybe get ahead of it too. Even if you're not in that Mm. position, I know even for me that, you know, I'm in a very happy relationship. And one of the things that I do fear, and I don't think this is going to happen per se, but I think just you know, my fear of abandonment from schemas, there's always this fear of will this end? And I think we just we just never know. But the alternative is not getting into a relationship that doesn't seem like the best way to deal with that fear either. So I think what uh, Dr. Gladys Otto, who is our guest today talks about is, you know, like creating that narrative, even if you're not in the current position that a breakup doesn't have to be what we think of like doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And when you zoom out of the fear of breakups and the fear of things ending, it's really just the fear of change. Yes. We only are, we know what we know, and we are comfortable in the person we used to know, the relationship we used to know, and we fear the unknown. How do we know that this change is going to be good for us? And this episode is really about being brave enough to face a change and to know that your next step is going to bring you closer to what what you want and not detract you from where you were not getting in that previous relationship. Yeah, I think what I've really like come to terms with too is we always say this, the only person you can control is yourself. I mean, it's it's a scary mm-hmm. thought that it, in reality, someone could change their mind any day about something that's regardless of what relationship you're in. That is just real life, even if you're married. And I think the only thing that we can really do is be secure enough with ourselves and happy enough with ourselves that we know that we'll be able to pick ourselves up if there was something that happened and changed in our relationship. And I think there's a lot of empowerment that comes with that because it takes the fear away. And it's, God forbid, I broke up with my boyfriend. Like, I would obviously miss hanging out with him and being with him. But I do feel that I've built a life that I'm happy with that I don't think I would be like, destroyed, I guess. Yeah. And something that Gladys will teach all of us in this episode is how to face the ending 
head on versus mm-hmm. trying to avoid it. A lot of us don't like to talk yes. about death or divorces or breakups. And she is really a proponent in saying, let's talk about it openly mm-hmm. and map out what a good ending would be. Now, to me, Julie, you know what a good ending is? What happened to Mr. Big? Okay. <laughs> I think that's the best ending you no. could possibly get from Mr. Big. No spoilers here, but you may have seen all the <laughs> all the articles that have been out about the new Sex and the City reboot. Come on. That is the best ending to Mr. Big. Okay. You and I drastically differ here, and we did give you <laughs> all a week to catch up. I feel like at this point, if you are a Sex and the City fan, you've already seen it. So I don't feel like we're blowing so. it for anyone. But that's why we were afraid from talking about it last week. I was ready to talk to UA about it the day it came out. So <laughs> uh, we have very differing views here. So I agree that Big was toxic. I agree A that we like, didn't have Okay. He was the original <laughs> fuck boy. I agree. But my romantic side, and I think this is why they went for it, right? Is like you want them to get together. And I always thought they had like the best banter and connection. And I know that doesn't make up for, you know, the the incompatibilities of not being reliable and trustworthy and all that stuff. But it's fantasy, it's fiction. And in my mind, I still like them being together. And I just hated that they killed him off. I just thought it was the worst (laughs) thing they could have done. I would have actually preferred them to be divorced if they wanted her to be single, because Mm. I think I know why they did it. They wanted it to be like, no, Carrie ended up having the love she always wanted. Fine, I get that. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it wouldn't have been totally off brand. It actually probably would have been more realistic if they broke up. You know, I mean, this is a perfect conversation for the for the breakup grief episode. That's for damn sure. You know, there is some stat out there that I think it's like 50% of couples break up at least once and then get back together. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, totally. But it becomes really toxic when it's on again, off again, on again, off again. And they were what, on again, off again for eight years or something? It was yeah, definitely some bullshit. Yeah, it, but I get it. Like, they had to do it for the storyline. Like, they couldn't just have carry in a happy relationship and we i mean we talked to candace bushnell about this we had her on the podcast and she i mean carrie is based off her she was carrie bradshaw yeah. and mr big existed he was an executive at a magazine natasha the natasha character did exist he did leave her for 25 year olds but they never got back together there was no cheating there was none of that reconciliation i get why sex in the city didn't go that direction because it was so you know core to the plot. Killing him off, I just, I hated it. I'm still upset about it. It's been weeks and I'm still upset about it because it's just, it was just morbid. I think that was like part of it. And I don't love that the like plot now is, you know, unraveling their their past relationship and her now like suspecting something was going on with Natasha. Just, it doesn't make any sense. And the actual plot just destroys me. I love it because it's not the fairy tale ending. I love that this is after the credits have rolled and they're like, let's check back in with a happy married couple and see what's up and you start to see that they were happy at the end of their marriage but now it's unraveling she's starting to remember how much of a dick he was to her and the fact (laughs) that their marriage started on both of them cheating on their partners that's never a good foundation for a relationship but my biggest gripe with Mr. Big that character is that he is the reason why women for so many years chase after fuck boys because they were looking for their Mr. Big. And the reason why their banter was so good was because he was inaccessible. He was always this mysterious man that came and went as he pleased. And it made her want to be on her A game every time she saw him because she didn't know when was the last time she would see him again. And I know that guy. I chased that guy. And that guy would have never been good for me. We all did. Yes. And Aiden, who I love, (laughs) who I think is still the better looking one, Okay, objectively speaking, he's still more no. handsome. Was all in for her. <laughs> he he was ready to marry her. He was so devoted to her. Even in the subsequent movies, he still was pining after her. I feel like that was a guy that was going to admire her and love her and respect her. But of course not because they didn't have the banter that she and Mr. Dick had. Yes, I called him Mr. Dick because <laughs> he's no longer big. Okay, 
I agree with you. I do think a lot of women, you know, definitely held on to this idea that eventually I can win this person over. I yeah. certainly did. And that came from this, that eventually would all work out even if they treated you like shit. I don't think Aiden was right for her either. I do think you need the banter to some degree because this is your life partner at the end of the day. They, I feel like they really had nothing in common. And I think what they had in common was that he adored her. And while I definitely mm. like want some one that adores me and I think all of us should strive for that that can't be the only quality of why you're with someone is that they adore you fair I think fair. she should have just looked for someone else I'm sure in New York City there were a zillion other dudes <laughs> it didn't have to be just the two of them you know but well, the ballet the po- dancer <laughs> yeah exactly should yeah, whatever the real was. life Candace oh well he wasn't the ballet dancer he was the artist Alexander Petrovsky oh, right but, but, but a real Candace ballet dancer in real life yes I don't know the, the whole new Sex of the City, I have such mixed emotions on it. I, of course, went back to rewatch the original last night, and it's just so much better. I mean, clearly, Samantha is a missing force. I think that I like what they're doing in the sense that they're making it more diverse and woke. They're, and that's where <laughs> I was going. They're tackling issues, but it feels very forced. And mm-hmm. I think that's the part of it that's a little challenging with it. Um, the podcast scenes are just a little cringy. But I do, I don't know if you've thought about this. You know, the um, the co-host, the guy Shay. that's representing. Oh, Bobby Lee. Yes. Oh. He reminds me so much of Tommy Danger Kit, one of our past guests. Oh, I agree. Yes. They're so, I feel like they could be brothers. They talk <laughs> the same way. They have the same sense of humor. <laughs> I kind of like the podcast scenes because it just shows the disconnect between Carrie and this podcast. Yeah. She is just like so out of her element. What What is really interesting about the juxtaposition of the two is that she was so ahead of her time during the initial Sex and the mm-hmm. City. She was like, you know, the the um, rebellious woman that wrote about sex. Risque. And all of a sudden, yeah. she was very risque. And now she's on a podcast where she's seen as conservative. And I kind of yeah. I find that kind of a fascinating transformation. But the new Sex in the City, I will still keep watching it. I'm not a big fan because what it does for me, Julie, is that it rehashes all the old feelings I have about Mr. Big like I have for an ex. So then I started looking at his track record and I was like, in what world was she so in love with this guy he oh, he was never around for her right okay he no. broke her heart m- numerous times he broke up with her like a thousand times okay let's also not forget that he cheated on his wife with her left his wife to be with Carrie and then at their wedding he stood her up he did not show up to the fucking <laughs> wedding okay that should have been well, that the end just right terrible. there yes now he sexually assaulted all these women I know it's the well. character <laughs> and the actor but I am <laughs> conflating the two because now they're the same person to me <laughs> he's he's back from the dead assaulting women <laughs> he's like dick on dick on dick like this guy is just grade a dick right there okay so when i said that i do like the fantasy of them being together which i still do i, I agree with all your logic you just said i'm not disagreeing i do for i try to forget that the movies never happened because they were just terrible so i actually terrible. kind of blocked off that whole bit i will say the show is actually better written i think than the movies the movies were a really low bar though it can oh, yeah, get worse yeah, than yeah, the movies yeah. but I think it's interesting to kind of tie it to our episode. I mean, in a few ways. I think (laughs) what you just said, sometimes we're in these positions that we want to keep going with, but are they really objectively what we even want and what, you know, Mm. will make us happy? We hear from listeners all the time about, you know, trying to like win over these people or this situationship that's not coming into fruition or someone not, you know, making plans or flaking all the time. And I think that does count as a breakup when it's over i think even you know ghosting can sting like but ultimately in these situations i think it is going back to yourself and being like is this even what i want how can you look at it Mm -hmm. objectively like you were just saying i think so many of us 
including myself, get wrapped up in the romance of it and the Mm -hmm. storyline. And that's what I think I like about the Mr. Big Carrie relationship. You want it to be triumphant. You want them to overcome it. Mm -hmm. But I think what you just laid out is so much more real life. You never know that like at a snap of a hat, like they could change completely. I was rewatching the episode actually that was a complete foreshadow for his death of when he goes into heart surgery. Oh, yeah. Car- and, cardiac arrest, yeah, right? And yes. she like is, you know, taking care of him. And you see the soft side of Mr. Big. And they he wakes up and just like that, he's back to himself. Do you see what I did there with the just like that? I didn't even mean to do that. That just came <laughs> just, out. <laughs> just like that. But I think the other piece that I find really fascinating is how she grieves with this. And I think while, yes, yes, there's a lot with Mr. Big that he is not the best partner for sure. I think she has a lot of work to do as well. We can't just blame. <laughs> yes, she does. We can't just blame Mr. Big. I think a lot of times. With for people, sure. You know, I was in a situation ship for way too freaking long and I actually don't blame the guy Mm -hmm. I look at myself and I'm like why did I stay in this like that was not serving Mm -hmm. me and what I wanted I think you need to take your own accountability and I think she is terrible at processing emotions or speaking up and communicating even the way he dies like she's like not crying and okay whatever I know people handle grief differently and I don't think she's avoiding the situation in the sense that she has come to terms that he has passed away but I think she's avoiding her feelings for sure. Yes, and her entire life revolves around Mr. Big. She <laughs> is always catering to him. When has he ever catered to her? The show may be about her, but it ended up being about him uh-huh. and how she was there for him. So again, I don't I'm not saying y'all go kill the guy that <laughs> has been a dick to you, but symbolically we can kill off that person yep. and free ourselves from this entrapment of this fuck boy who made it seem like it was such an interesting relationship and then you fast forward to them in their 50s and he's so fucking old looking oh, with yeah. his beer belly yeah you know, and he's fast like, forward to that moment do you still want to be with this person because i surely was like he lost all his appeal to me just put them on a peloton right that's the way to get them out <laughs> yeah kill them with a stationary bike the Peloton commercial, though, is the funniest thing I've ever seen with Mr. Big. Like, they planned that so well. I mean, the whole uh, the whole thing is fascinating to me. Peloton claims they did not know they were being used in this way. Oh, yeah, it was all, it was all planned. I was going to say, like, how did they come back with that ad so damn fast with so it? So fast. And it was like a Peloton yeah. instructor was playing the character. How would she have done it yes. without any sign-off? But I do think their whole... When I was like rewatching uh, that episode of him with the cardiac arrest. He he does this thing like I'm alive in that voice and in that <laughs> ad he did the exact same thing and I found it so funny. Oh, so, the whole thing is so dumb. It's so dumb. But I I, I think that I have some predictions for the rest of the season. I think Miranda's going to be a lesbian. She's going oh, to be exploring sure. her sexuality. They've already shown a little bit of that. Uh, Charlotte's daughter is now non-binary and she's going to have to navigate that with her family. Yep. So yeah, we're, we're pushing the boundaries a little bit. This is actually, Julie and I had this vision for a new Sex in the City. What would it look like in 2021? Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much how we pictured it, except with younger people. Sorry, we did not have 50-some-year-old characters in our idea. <laughs> and Carrie is definitely going to be back on the apps. Oh, yeah, that would be fascinating. Well, Aiden's coming back. Oh my God, is he? No, 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 I don't know Oh, for you sure. don't know I that, just, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think she needs to go out on Tinder and find someone new. That's my feel. Well, I just look through. I l- like to look through Aiden's Instagram and oh see if God. he's had any work recently. And he <laughs> has it. So he's definitely making a comeback. Just so you know. <laughs> Whatever his real name is. John Corbett or something. Yeah. Oh, his name is John. Yeah, anyone that's not a Sex of the City fan is probably just like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? But I, I would go on a gamble that a lot of our listeners are OG Sex of the City fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even my boyfriend's like super into what's going on right now. And he never even really watched. Mine too. He's like, this is, great. He's like, this is terrible, but I'm going to keep watching. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Everyone yes. I've talked that's to so is the same boat. It's like, we acknowledge this is horrible. This should never have been made. 
made, but we are still in for it. I am so on board with it. I lost my internet like all day yesterday. I was like, I'm going to stream Sex of the City on my phone. That is the one I did. <laughs> you watched it on the phone? That is pure desperation i didn't realize (laughs) okay moving on to our question debate over julie's been pent up all week trying to have this debate with me on air so there you go you guys you all witnessed i feel like you kind of converted me to the other side through it (laughs) i win i win no you can't argue with fuck boy like that's just no one's gonna be like he was a very nice young man no it's that fantasy side of mine coming through sometimes you need to just be the realist yes i will shake the i will shake the big out of you if that time ever comes okay our question for this episode how can you tell if you're over your ex Mm. And we do touch upon this in this episode a little bit, but I think just by virtue of asking this question, you're probably not over (laughs) your ex. I will start there. If your ex is still taking up real estate in your mind and they're living there rent free, as people like to say, you're not over your ex and you haven't fully processed them out of your system. I think if you're trying to find them still, and I think social media makes this too damn easy, if you are looking up your ex on social media, my ex didn't even use social media yet, I would still look him up. (laughs) He like barely posted ever, but I still would search for him. And then there becomes a day that you don't anymore. And that's when you know that Mm -hmm. you've moved on or when you're secretly hoping they're going to text you out of nowhere or, you know, everything you see reminds you of them in some way and then one day you're just not thinking about them and I think that's when you have moved on from your ex oh I've been there so many times there are days that you a lot of us try to recognize patterns well usually he would have texted me by now usually after we break up he would have contacted me by now and then you get all disappointed if they don't Mm -hmm. that's when you know you're really not over it because you're still counting down the days and I've also found with myself I know I'm not over an ex when I talk shit about them if someone's Mm -hmm. like oh what was your last relationship like if I go on a first date and then Mm -hmm. I talk shit about them how terrible they were or how toxic they were I know I'm not over it because it's still affecting me somehow you start to feel like you're over your ex when it doesn't affect you like that anymore you can talk about Mm -hmm. it more objectively and not get all worked up about it I think it can swing the other way too is even if you're not talking shit about them but you're comparing everyone you meet oh you're keeping them on this pedestal because I've been there before where one I would come out of the date and be like this was horrible because they're not like my ex and be upset instead of giving a new person a new chance that's one piece of it yeah the other side is sometimes I would find myself even talking about my ex on dates and that means that you're not over it you know I think there's a time and a place to reveal some of your past relationship history but especially on a first date I don't think that's necessary and I think sometimes when you're spending a lot of time talking about your ex there's an ulterior motive that you're just want to talk about them and not because yeah you need to like get information about this new person in any way so I think yeah I mean I think sometimes it does take just meeting someone else I think there's a piece of that that you might never be fully over them until you meet someone else but I think you start to see it wane when you're you know, Mm -hmm. constantly thinking about them, it's very hard to meet someone else because they are just, even if they're not physically with you or even in contact, they're just occupying so much mental space. So I think if you're not told 100% over your ex, you can cut yourself some slack and don't feel like you need to be 100% to date again. Because I just don't know if that's ever realistic. But... I do think you can tell when you are 75% not over them. <laughs> and that's probably not the right place to be in to date. No, and you you know it. You just feel it because you're still indulging yourself in those moments of memories. You're still going down that path mm-hmm. of, oh, I remember when we did this and how we met and the moment he or she said this to me. Yep. You're still living in that world in the past. You haven't exactly come into the present. So how can you even focus on the 
the future. And like Julie said, it's be very open to that feeling. That's okay. Don't don't be too hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. But also acknowledge that that's what you're going through. Something you'll hear in this episode is you have to fully process the person Mm -hmm. before you can say that you are over them. And processing means feeling the feelings still and not ignoring them. Every time you think of your ex, it doesn't help you to say, no, I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to distract myself because they're going to keep coming up anyway. So you just got to go through the process of letting like getting them out. Yep, that's why Carrie's fucked. She just hasn't gone through the process yet. It's just going to come out in Waterworks (laughs) season finale. I can see it already. Oh, my God. Sometimes processing is different for uh, different people, but coming to terms with what's going on and not holding them on this pedestal is really important. I feel like there's so many good things that I want to start talking about, but we have an entire episode Mm -hmm. to do that. So we're going to move on to some announcements. So like UA said, this is our season finale, but don't worry, we will be back starting in January. We will be taking one week breather over the holidays. So no worries. We will be back the first Wednesday of January. If you're not subscribed already, make sure to hit subscribe so you can get it Tuesday night, right when the episode drops. And if you are, there's usually a little delay. So if you're not subscribed, sometimes it takes longer to get that episode. So get on it. Uh, The other piece is send it to a friend. You know, there's always an episode in our back catalog that is exactly what someone needs to hear in the moment that they're in. We guarantee this episode about process processing breakups is probably super relevant either to you or to someone you know. So, you know, send the love around and share this episode out. Mm -hmm. So the last announcement we have, we all know that January to February is super hot for dating apps. It's, you know, what is it? The first Sunday of the new year is the Super Bowl of dating apps, the busiest day of the year. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, that new year new me. Valentine's Day is always, you know, something that's in the back of our minds, whether we like it or not. So we all hear all the time from you all how difficult dating apps are and how challenging they are. And we really strongly believe it does not have to be. So you can wait till January to hear what we have up our sleeves boyfriends from apps as well. And I think they really are a great resource. So we have something very special that's coming. We're not going to say all too much. We will say it's not a program like our Finding Your Person program. It is a bit different. So you can wait till January to hear what we have up our sleeves. Okay, let's take a quick break now to hear from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. With so much going on in the world today, wouldn't it be nice to know there's a dedicated team on your side to help you through all of life's ups and downs? That's why we're so happy to introduce you to BetterHelp, a professional counseling platform that matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. Send a message to your counselor anytime or do what I do, schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. They're licensed professional counselors specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, grief, and so much more. Just check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. We want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash dateable. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp better h e l p dot com slash d a t e a b l e this episode is brought to you by drizzly fun fact number one it's gifting season fact number two no one returns alcohol and fact number three i love gifts hint hint And so for this year, get everyone on your list, and I hope I'm on someone's list, the gift of beer, wine, and spirits delivered right to their doorstep with Drizzly in under 60 minutes. It's no wonder Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery. And I love that I can share my favorite bottle of wine with my favorite friends without even leaving my house. It sure makes those virtual gatherings so much more entertaining with bottles of Brunello all around. So right now, 
out, Drizzly's giving every new customer $5 off their first order. Just use the promo code FAST5 at checkout. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's spelled D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And use the promo code FAST5, that's spelled F-A-S-T and the number 5, for $5 off your first order. Okay, let's get to our conversation with Dr. Gladys Otto. I know that we were trying to figure this out, but the last time we saw Dr. Gladys Otto, I think it was how many years ago? Three years ago? Is that what we decided on? Three years ago, right before. Right the before. World changed. Right before the world changed. But we saw you talk about grief and I guess parting ways, things that happen in life, and it really moved us. So we're Mm -hmm. so happy to finally have you on our show, Gladys, to talk about everything that has to do with breakups, changes, the end, the beginning, because with every (laughs) beginning, there is an end. With every end, there is a beginning. So who is Dr. Gladys Otto? She is 47 years old, lives in Mexico right now. She's been there for nine months and loving it. She has no plans of leaving Mexico, as she told us (laughs) originally from California. She's a clinical psychologist, grief and loss expert, public speaker, and author of The Good Goodbye, How to Navigate Change and Loss in Life, Love, and Work. In addition to co-hosting her own podcast, Time Out with Gladys and Ula, Dr. Otto has shared her thought leadership in several top publications and podcasts, including BBC News, Forbes, TEDx, Lincoln Square, NPR, NBC News, and the Dateable Podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Gonna add that to the list of credentials. And she's been such a leader in this space and speaking about loss, which is a topic that many of us don't talk about openly. So I'm glad that we're, mm-hmm. we are openly talking about this now. Glad it's so nice to have you on our show finally. Oh, Yay. I am so thrilled and just super looking forward to what I know is going to be such a juicy conversation for everybody. Yes. I remember, <laughs> I remember when you spoke, I mean, you talk about grief and loss at beyond just dating. This is, you know, all aspects mm-hmm. of life. But I remember you and I thinking this would be a great topic for the podcast because Because sometimes it feels like breakups are such a form of loss, but it's not at the same level of death. But sometimes Mm -hmm. it can really sting at that side, too. So I think it's really good that we're kind of addressing this with you. And we know that, you know, from your life experience, you dealt with the loss and the passing of your mother at an early age. And that kind of stemmed to why you were so interested in this topic. Were there any like romantic situations that you kind of experienced loss in, too? Um, kinda, yeah, many. <laughs> where do I like, start? Where do I start? Yeah, <laughs> I have to share that. Um, first off, this is this is a bit of me checking off something off of my dream list because I have for several decades wanted to talk about relationships. Mm. And I'm not a relationship therapist. It's not part of my specialty and my background. But having gone through a number of breakups myself that crushed my soul, Mm. those were the moments that I felt that death experience the hardest. Those were the moments where I felt that my sense of self was shattered. Those were the times when trying to think about getting out of bed Mm -hmm. was the hardest thing that I could possibly do. And my self-worth plummeted every Mm. single time. So I went through the ringer in my own relationships. And then when my mom died, that just like knocked everything out of the ballpark because that was the biggest loss I would ever experience. But my perspective on grief, on loss, on breakups, on relationships in general have all been shaped by the loss experiences that I've had relationally. And so here I am today in a position where I can speak from both my expertise as a psychologist, but also my lived experience and really provide a fresh perspective on what it is that we are dealing with when it comes to loss and to really help fill in a lot of gaps that unfortunately have been left wide open in terms of media and society and all the all the crap out there that tells us what 
breakups and loss should be like. Right. Yeah. And if you think about it, we celebrate the beginning of relationships. We celebrate Mm -hmm. the DTR conversation, getting married and getting engaged. But the end of the relationship, we always celebrate what was there. And we don't talk about what comes next. So why do you think it is so hard for people to talk about loss and grief and the ending of things? Yeah. Well, the biggest reason is that we just haven't been educated or given the tools to know how to have healthy dialogue and even a just a healthy perspective around it. And it's it's no fault of our own. I think it's important to establish that first. Uh, you know, when we think of loss, what are some of the the immediate words of that describe the feelings that you associate with loss? Sadness. I think there's almost like this shame that you did like something wrong too, especially when a breakup happens, which mm. seems so stupid saying that out loud, but I think there is some of that. Absolutely. And and I'm raising my hand as somebody that felt a lot of shame because I have this very strong narrative in my personal life that I'm always doing something wrong or fucking things up. Mm. And this is why I'm type A perfectionist. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> ditto on that. <laughs> I think also like sadness, like it just feels like very dismal and at the end of the path opposed to like starting of something new. Exactly. So, you know, when I was uh, doing research to write my book, The Good Goodbye, I did a little focus group to basically get input on the same kind of question that I just asked you. When it comes to loss, when it comes to endings change, what are the feelings that you associate with it? And some of the top responses were sadness, anxiety, anger. Mm -hmm. Anger. mm -hmm, Which was very interesting. So if we look at it from that lens, Loss means it's going to provoke an emotion in us that we are not accustomed to tolerating, that we tend to want to escape, get away from, Mm. avoid, move past. And it's Mm -hmm. not that we need to wallow in it. But what we're doing, if we zoom out, all that's happening is that our, our attention and our focus in the moment of a breakup is going to one end of the emotional spectrum. And that's the side that we tend to label grief, which are those hard emotions that we just identified. But on the other end of the emotional spectrum, there's also joy, celebration, mm-hmm. gratitude, acceptance, understanding, forgiveness. Same emotional spectrum. We just haven't been taught how to embrace the other end. Mm. So when it comes to how we can navigate breakups or loss of any kind, the work isn't to diminish those tough feelings mm-hmm. because heartbreak is real. Mm-hmm. But it's to be educated that just as real as a heartbreak is the heart breaking through to a new threshold of expansion. Right. I think some of it, though, is, I mean, obviously, there's a loss of the person. But I think some of it is, you know, the loss Mm -hmm. of the life that you thought you were going to move forward with. And now, you know, there is like this, like, starting over feeling. How do you kind of see people navigate between the two of not being with that person versus like starting over Mm -hmm. and change that comes with it? Yeah, well, the starting over that provokes a lot of anxiety in people because it's a path of unknown. We don't know what it's going to be like without this person in our life. We don't know how we're going to show up differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know one thing that I have have mulled over myself and just reflection of past relationships that have ended is, am I going to make the same mistakes next Mm -hmm. time? Right. And so we can also develop a bit of a fear and anxiety around this belief that maybe we are missing signs or something's wrong with us or we are fucking things up. And so stepping into that new chapter can be filled with so much of this unknown space that it makes us uncomfortable. And the tendency when we're uncomfortable is to grab on to things that make us comfortable, things that help us feel grounded, things that help us feel a sense of security and safety. But if we are grabbing onto the past, things from back then to help us feel safe and secure, what we can end up inadvertently doing is bringing those pieces of our past relationship into the future. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes isn't in our favor. 
And Gladys, I'm sure a lot of our listeners right now are reminiscing about some of the bad breakups they've experienced. Can you walk us through the worst breakup you've ever experienced? Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, where's my tissues? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so, so my mom passed away in 2003. And at the time, um, a day before she passed away, I actually was able to have a, an art reception to showcase my art. And at that time, I used to call myself a closet artist because I would paint, I would draw, but nobody would see it because I throw it in a closet. Mm. And so I was part of San Francisco's first Thursdays where a bunch of yeah. art galleries open up to the public. And so I had a reception. My family was there. My partner and I were there. My sister had a partner after Afterwards, my family went to dinner and it was a very complete moment with my boyfriend, my sister's boyfriend, my parents. Next day, my mom passed away very suddenly from a brain aneurysm. And oh. that was in 2003. And then I believe it was 2005, the winter of 2005, so almost two years later. Um, my boyfriend and I broke up. Mm. And it was a combination of a lot of accumulated grief mm -hmm. that I was going through. Um, anytime that we are going through a loss, whether it is a, a loss of somebody that died or there's an illness, any kind of stressor, and you're in a relationship, it does a number on your relationship mm. as well, mm -hmm. right? And so this became a really big stressor for my partner and I. Plus, we were dealing with our own existing issues that we were trying to resolve in therapy. And it just got to a breaking point where he decided we're done. Mm. And that moment snowballed into a series of losses for me. So when we were living together at the time, and I had to move out because it was his home. Mm. We had uh, adopted a dog together. The oh. dog stayed with him. Ouch. Oh, yeah. I was then living on, you know, in my, on my sister's couch. I went to my friend's place for over a month and I was staying in her daughter's bedroom. Um, I was not eating. I was drinking and sure to just get enough kinds of calories and nutrients within me. I, and remind you guys, this is like a couple years after my mom died. So right. this is yeah. like grief on top of grief, but also right. in addition to my life changing physically, our dog, being separated from me, mm -hmm. friends also separated. So there were friends that kind of allied with him, friends that allied with me. So my social life changed. Mm. Then I had to leave the community that I was living in in San Francisco to find a new rental on my own. And a couple months after that breakup, uh, a cousin of mine was killed. And oh my she gosh. was um, she was getting married on Valentine's Day. And the night before, um, there was a drive-by shooting <gasps> and her and her unborn baby Baby were killed. Oh so my god! Talk about fucking trauma and loss in a <sighs> very short amount of time. That was the worst breakup ever. And I will tell you, you know, it's it's been several. I mean, it's been decades since I've talked about this. But going back now and just reflecting on it, I'm having two feelings. Number one, it's like holy crap. That was a that was a doozy, right? Because it was yeah. loss after loss after loss after loss. But also, I'm very aware that unconsciously what happened then, and I was in my late 20s, um, maybe I was turning 30, right? So I was also mm. entering a new decade of life. That was a pivotal breaking point for me. Yeah. And everything around my beliefs of relationships and mm. loss started to crumble mm. and change. And looking at where I'm at now, right, I'm, I'm approaching 50 in, in a small number of years. I know that the work that was left for me to do was to rebuild mm. my internal sense of safety and security to know that no matter what kind of loss I endured in life, because we're always going to have loss, Mm -hmm. That I would be able to not only get back up, but I would be able to maintain my sense of self and not let that crumble with everything crumbling around me. And this is what I now call becoming the eye of the storm. Mm. Wow. I love that. I think that's such a powerful way to put it because I think there's yeah. – I think that does prevent a lot of people from even entering relationships because there's mm -hmm. this fear of it ending or I've talked to a lot of friends about this. Like, I don't want another one to end. Like, I think yeah. that goes back to, you know, the 
the feeling of picking things up, but also like this feeling of being a failure almost in this. Yes. But mm-hmm. I think the strengthening of your own self is really the only thing to do. Cause like, what's the alternative? You just never enter a relationship. Yeah. Like that's not necessarily the, the answer either. I guess like how can people start to, you know, build that sense of self and get over that fear? Yeah. And yeah jump in head first, even if they are, had a bad breakup in the past. Well, I think one of the, the pre-steps to doing that, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, is recognizing that any relationship that you are in is solely a reflection of the relationship that you have with yourself. That's it. Can you say and, that one more time? I feel like people need to hear that one more time, <laughs> yep. including myself. Yeah. Any relationship you are in is solely a reflection for the relationship you have with yourself. Mm. We are creators. We forget that. We are born knowing that we are here to create anything we desire, and yet we lose that knowing as we go through society and life. The relationships that we have with other people are mirrors. That's all they Mm. are. And if we can accept that and look at life through that knowing, okay, this is a universal truth. Everything outside of you is a reflection of what's in you. Mm. Then if a relationship ends... Task number one, be really freaking gentle with yourself. Yeah. That's it, right? Because what you're seeing outside is just showing you where there's an opportunity to heal, Mm. to close a chapter, to redefine who you are within you. And if we look at it through that lens, we realize that anytime a door closes, it's a gift. Mm, It's a mm -hmm. gift and opportunity of expansion because that as creators, we are here to expand. And the only way we expand in this life on this earth is through contrast. So the Mm. contrast that we receive in relationships, right, if a relationship doesn't work, that's providing a contrast to you of where you feel that there was synergy and not synergy. And a lot of times when we go through a breakup, it's very easy to fall into that place of blame, whether Mm -hmm. you're blaming outward, right? Or you're blaming inward so much that you can't really step into this place of reflection. So in those moments, it's really important to understand that being gentle with yourself isn't just treating yourself to ice cream and Netflix for as long as you need. That's really (laughs) helpful. But also, it's being gentle with your nervous system. One of the key areas that I focus on in my work is teaching people how to identify what their nervous system feels like and how to develop a different relationship with their nervous system so that they know how to ease their nervous system so that your nervous system isn't on edge because your nervous system is designed to keep you safe. Right. And if you're going through a breakup or if you're going through mental chatter of you not being good enough, you Mm -hmm. fucked up again, or that person shouldn't have done this and all of that, your nervous system is in a chronic state of agitation. Mm -hmm. So from a chronic state of agitation, you your mind cannot do any real processing that will be beneficial for you. So don't try to go to the meditation. Don't try to go to the mindfulness. Don't try to like be Zen with everything (laughs) happens for a reason or all those generic things people say when you go through a breakup. Right. (laughs) Instead, get clear on what your nervous system needs and help de-escalate your nervous system so you can feel that deep breath. That's when you know your nervous system is chilling out is when you feel that exhale throughout your entire body. Then you can start to go to your mind and and do some of that recorrective self-talk because your Mm -hmm. mind now isn't in fight or flight mode, Mm -hmm. right? So it always amazes me how people process breakups so differently. Mm -hmm. Like there's some people that just bounce back immediately and then there's other is I've definitely been this person that takes like months and months and arguably too long to get over something. Hmm. I guess like what are your thoughts on this? Like there's a sex of the city saying that like it takes like half the time you dated to get over someone. Is there kind of like a silver bullet or is it really like person by person or have the people that kind of get over it quicker figured out how to process it better? The first thing that came to mind is it takes as long as you need it to until it doesn't feel good anymore. Yeah. Mm. And that's going to look different for every single person. So what does feel good mean? Now this can get, I won't go down the rabbit hole too much, but I think there are two ways to understand feeling good. If you are suffering and you don't like that suffering, right? You could say this doesn't feel good. 
But if you have a history of suffering and suffering has kind of become your norm, mm. it might be a comfortable place for you to be. Interesting. It's a default. Mm. Right? It's your default. And so it's like a security blanket. You, This is what you know. And so you might hang out there underneath that security blanket a lot longer than you might realize you actually mm. are benefiting from just because it's familiar to you. Mm. So a better question to ask yourself in these moments, um, if you find that you are suffering, right, that you are various areas in your life are being impacted. I think that's one of the, the good things from uh, my background as a clinical psychologist, whenever we are doing an assessment um, with a new client, is what areas of life are being impacted by the stressor. Mm. If you find that you are becoming more isolated, may, or maybe you're becoming extra clingy, right? Like you're talking to friends and you're repeating the same story yep. over and over and over again, right? And then yep. that friend gets tired of it. So you go to the other friend that's right. fresh and is going to listen to it all the beginning. <laughs> it's check in with your with your your inner dialogue and be able to pause enough where your nervous system is chilled out, right? Where your brain is a little bit more calm and ask yourself, am I benefiting from this right now? Mm. So instead of looking at, okay, this should be six months because it was a year relationship or yeah. whatever, look at it. Am I benefiting from this feeling right now? Day by day. And mm -hmm. sometimes it can be an hour by hour question. And then mm. what about the flip side? Because I could see like the people that bounce back. I know I had a friend once that, you know, had this terrible breakup, was dating someone new within like a month. Mm -hmm. And then it all hit six months later. Yeah. Is there this possibility of kind of avoiding the feeling when you're jumping back too soon? Or is it there a way that you can process it and still jump back in? Again, I think it varies by, by each individual. I have a really dear friend of mine who has made it a practice to not date anybody for a year after he ends up, after he's ended a relationship so that he can actually be in a place of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Because, because he also understands this universal truth. Everything outside of you is just a mirror for what's in you. He wants to learn from all of these moments um, of contrast. So he takes the time that he needs and he's put a time frame on it. You know, I don't think you need to be that prescriptive. But if you are, if you've gone through a breakup and then you immediately meet someone new and your full attention is on that new, but you haven't felt closure or completeness or resolution of the past, just know it's going to come back up. And, mm -hmm. you know, some people are cool with that because they need a little bit of that buffer space to just recalibrate. And, and again, if we look at it through that lens of a nervous system calibration, right, like we got to do things to help our nervous systems recalibrate so we can feel grounded and safe again. That's all we're trying to do in these moments. We're trying to find safety. We're trying to find security. Some of us find safety and security in isolation. Mm -hmm. Some of us find safety and security in connection to other. Mm. So if we look at it just as us simply trying to regulate all that barrage of emotions, we can't have prescriptions or timeframes for anybody because it's going to depend on that unique person. Gladys, I don't know if you've seen this pattern, but in my dating coach experience from years and years ago, I found that a lot of people after a breakup would be fine in the first few months because mm -hmm. they're like, there's so many people out there. There's online dating. They start dating uh, pretty frequently. And then one day something reminds them of their ex. It's a smell. <laughs> it's a place. It's a type of food. And they just break down. Yeah. And in those experiences, every all of my clients said, I just need to seek closure. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about this overwhelming mm -hmm. need to seek closure? Is it necessary? <laughs> and is there such a thing as uh -huh. seeking closure? <laughs> yeah, what does closure look like? You know, it reminds me of the five stages of grieving. And for those listening that aren't familiar with it, this was developed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So five stages of grieving are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Mm. So that that response that you're talking about, the first couple of months, they're fine. There might be some shock in it, mm. right? It might be some denial. We don't know. It depends on per person. It might be that they've just fully gone to the acceptance place and now they're just moving through the layers. But there was, there was an unintended interpretation that the final step in the grieving process 
is acceptance, which is what you're referring to as closure. Mm. We're complete with it all. We feel resolved. We're good. We've integrated. We can move on. We're not affected anymore. And I called bullshit on that in Mm. writing my book, The Good Goodbye, because if we become so finite in thinking about this, we are not accepting that loss, change, grief is an evolutionary process. Mm-hmm. Everybody doesn't have to start with denial and end at acceptance. <laughs> and so I, my approach, which I call the good goodbye approach, is more counterintuitive in that I start with acceptance first by redefining acceptance as just recognizing what's in front of you mm. without trying to change it. That's it. I think that is so important because I know I can speak to my past breakup that was like one of those I couldn't get out of bed, like detrimental Mm -hmm. breakups. And there was this period that I did not accept what happened, that I thought, you know, if this changed, then like this will work out. And it was kind of like, oh, I'll just check in in like three months. And then, you know, there was always this feeling of like, this isn't over. And in my head, I thought like, this is still my person, even though it was over. How Mm -hmm. do you, how can you get to that stage of acceptance? Like, how can you be kind of like, I mean, in theory, it could have been just like, this is over, like, this isn't your person. But that seems a lot easier in retrospect, when you're not going through it. Like, how can you help someone when you're in the thick of it? Right. Well, it goes back to really asking yourself, am I benefiting from this right now? So lying in bed, thinking that maybe in three months you'll get back together, does that benefit you? And if the answer is yes, right, you're not going to change. Mm. Right? If, you, if you find benefit in it, I mean, you can have Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra talking in both ears and they <laughs> might not change your perspective because you're still finding value in mm. holding on to this possibility. Now, one thing that I, I do recommend is – and this is a really tough one. I mean, I'm, I'm pausing on even saying this because I understand that when you're in the thick of it, you're just too focused on the emotional experience. So I'm going to caveat this by saying one great practice to have is as you're going through the thick of it, practice regulating your nervous system on a daily basis with something as simple as a technique that I developed called the reset remedy. It's repeating four phrases to yourself over and over again to stop the mental chatter that's driving you crazy. And you guys all know what I'm talking about. Like you're watching TV, yep. but you're replaying <laughs> shit in your head and over then you're and thinking over about what that person will say. Yeah. Okay. That's called rumination. Okay. Or perseverative mm-hmm. thinking. So the reset remedy is a way to stop that, to press the pause button. So your nervous system system can chill out, you can recalibrate your thoughts, and you can just have a moment of peace. Mm. Okay. Now, as you practice this over and again, the part that I was hesitating on offering, because I know how grueling breakups are, it is to practice going within. Where do I want to go next? Mm. What do I want this next Mm -hmm. chapter to look and feel like? How do I want to show up today? In this moment, in this hour, in this minute, am I benefiting from what I'm experiencing right now? Because remember, everything external is just a reflection of what's inside. We overemphasize keeping our focus on the external, them, them, them. Mm -hmm. What if this? What if that? What are they doing on Facebook? Oh my God, they were at a party. Who is this person that just liked their (laughs) post? And then we start keeping the focus external. Yep. That is a way to avoid Mm -hmm. the invitation internally to take care of yourself and a beautiful visual to hold. If you had a little three-year-old child that was sitting by your feet with scabbed knees and elbows, okay, a torn face that's bleeding, tears streaming down their eyes, looking up at you asking for help, how would you respond to them? Would you ignore them and get on Instagram to check your ex's latest story? Right. Or would you turn to this little three-year-old and say, how can I help you? I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And you guys, if only, if I had the ability to give myself that kind of attention when I went through my breakups, I wouldn't have dragged my self-worth through the gutter as often as I did. Right. But I had no connection to my sense of self. And that's 
all that we're asking you to do in those moments when we say go inward. Mm -hmm. Just envision your little three-year-old saying, please hold me and let me know I'm going to be okay. Mm. I think the self-worth is so, like, I can see even in my own breakup, like, years later, clearly, but, like, in the moment did not see this, that a lot of it was tied to my own self, that I thought that this Mm -hmm. was, like, I couldn't find someone else. Like, there was, like, that piece of it that honestly had nothing to do, actually, with my ex when you're really thinking about it. But, like, how can you start to like get that self-worth like realization and realize Mm -hmm. that it ties to your self-worth because I think so many people are in the state that you're describing of just how do I get this person back I feel like I bought so many books of like how can I get my ex back you know Mm -hmm. it's like how do you get out of that state and focus inwards yeah well I mean, let's go with that. I think that would be a. Is there a book called How to Get Your Ex Back? It's many. I, I, I believe I bought <laughs> there that are book. Many. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like if there isn't, someone should get on that SEO immediately. I know. I'm like, maybe I should write that next book. <laughs> yeah. And then be like, and look at yourself. That's how you get it. Exactly. Your ex <laughs> Just one, one sentence. Page. That's yep. it. <laughs> Thanks for your 1099. Thanks. <laughs> you guys aren't actually going to write that book. Okay, so here here let's go with that, right? If you're in a state of how do you get your ex back? Let's let's work with that energy because that's where you're at right now. That's what's real to you. That's where your focus is. Number 1, recognize that everything is energy. Everything is energy. The energy you put out is the energy you receive back. So if you want the energy of your ex coming right back to you, you got to get your energy in that right state to actually be a vibrational match for what your ex is at so that he or she comes back to you naturally, okay? Being in bed, ruminating on stuff from the past does not help you raise your energy to be at a vibrational state of calling love back in. Mm -hmm. What we don't realize is that when we are heartbroken, right? When When we are aching, when we are in a state of suffering, a lot of times we are identifying as a victim. Mm. And victim state energy does not attract love relationship connection energy. It just doesn't. So if you want to get your ex back, you got to raise that vibrational energy up to being an empowered, open woman, man who is ready for love. And Mm. the only way that can happen energetically Okay. And there's, there's research around this, right? If I, I think I was it Osho that did the studies on water. If you look at the way that you talk to water or to plants, there were studies done on this and you talk to one plant through negative self-talk and you talk to another plant through positive self-talk, guess which plant grows fastest? <laughs> Fast, right? Yeah. Okay. So if we look at it through that lens, give yourself benefit of the doubt love on yourself, Mm -hmm. do the positive self-practices that you know how to do, not to minimize those tough emotions. Be with the emotions as though it was a little three-year-old needing your love. But when you do that inner work, you will raise your vibrational energy to that place where it is a match for love because love is the highest energy vibration that we have on this planet. Mm. And it is an energy of openness. And when we're wounded, we're not open. Right. So you got to heal first before you're going to welcome in a a healed relationship. And it's bullshit that I remember (laughs) when I was in my 20s being like, fuck yeah, whatever. You know, I got to love myself first. I couldn't tolerate it. And I didn't want to look at it because I hated myself, you guys, back Mm. then. I I genuinely hated who I was as a a human being. And that was a result of a lot of childhood trauma. Mm. So I was close to it. But through my work that I've done uh, in my own therapy, my own healing practices, and obviously my background as a psychologist, and then going through multiple other relationships to practice, what I'm sharing with you all now is the golden ticket to stepping into a new chapter Mm -hmm. where you can receive anything and everything you desire relationally, but you got to realize that you are your own generator of energy. No one else is. So it has to start with you first. Mm. Okay. Let's take a quick break for a few messages. Have you ever thought about how much better dating would be if you had a whole army of people supporting you along the way? We know that dating can be frustrating and lonely. 
but it can also feel fulfilling and fun. Have you recently decided you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're just ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes monthly office hours where you can drop in and chat with us about anything, weekly sound offs with guided discussions, and regular virtual happy hours. Allow Julie and I to become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can all navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. I do want to ask you a kind of a controversial question here. Mm -hmm. Controversial Mm -hmm. between Julie and I, basically. We (laughs) debate about this all the time. And it's sometimes it's not black and white at an end of a a breakup. Maybe you Mm -hmm. don't want your ex back, but maybe you don't want them completely out of your life either. So Mm -hmm. I personally like murder my exes in my mind after we break up. I just feel like (laughs) I cannot. I just it doesn't serve me to be around them. That's how I move on. Julie and a lot of our listeners feel like it's fine to stay friends or contact your ex later down the line when you feel like you're ready to. Is there a clear, I'm sure you will say that it's up to the individual, but do you believe that there is a strong stance on something like this of keeping your ex energetically around? You know, if you had asked me that question seven years ago, I would have said, absolutely, you don't have to keep him in your life. When you're done, you're done. You close the door, you move on. That helps you get closure. I went through a breakup that was a a very significant breakup for me in 2015. Um, This also was clustered around me closing the doors of a university where I was a president and CEO. So Mm -hmm. I was going through, again, a number of goodbyes. I was Mm -hmm. also leaving my the corporate career that I had built, venturing out to start my own business. And my ex had said to me in relationship, when we were still in a relationship, um, some comment about how he's friends with all of his exes. And I looked at him with like bewildered eyes and said, <laughs> what? What? Why? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not friends with any of my exes. Like we don't talk. We're not connected on Facebook. None of that. And he goes, yeah, I mean, why, why would you need to not have communication with somebody that you admittedly at some point loved? Mm-hmm. Love doesn't end. And I'm like, yeah, but, and we, so we did the whole argument thing, right? Mm. And UA, I think you and I are probably on in the same camp. And Julie, <laughs> you would have been on, on his camp. Well, this man was, was persistent and we are the best of friends today. Mm-hmm. And I, I okay. would have swore that it would have never happened. Now, wow. would I invite this in with past exes? No, because remember, everything is energy. Mm-hmm. And the energetic vibrational state that I'm at, having done all the inside work that I have, I'm high vibe. Okay? Yeah. So for me to invite in an ex that maybe isn't high vibe, maybe hasn't done the same kind of spiritual work, that will not necessarily be a good energetic match. So to have him or, you know, to have him in my life for me personally would not really bring value, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It might be familiar. It might be nice, but do I need to put a steel wall between us if they reached out? No, absolutely not. I had Mm -hmm. one ex reach out to me after several years of breaking up and, um, and I was surprised, but I welcomed him mm-hmm. to a conversation. And then I never heard from him. He just needed to reach out to say, hello, yep. thank you for what our relationship meant for me. You changed my life. And then I never heard from him again. Mm. So just be mindful. And this always goes back to why everything outside of you is just a mirror for what's inside of you. Mm-hmm. If you remember you are a creator in this life and you are your own source of energetic output, mm-hmm. then you get to be selective of the energies that you surround yourself with. And if you take that perspective, you are honoring yourself as a creator that you are. You don't want to put unleaded gasoline into a Lamborghini that requires premium. Mm. You're going to take really great care of that Lamborghini, right? It's the same thing with the people that you allow in your Mm. life, whether they're love interests or friends, family members, coworkers. This (laughs) applies to any any other human being. So Mm -hmm. I have changed my tune over the years with this topic. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to make sure that that's clear. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> for the record. Uh, okay, so in theory, I agree with your ex of like, this is someone you loved. Why wouldn't you want this person in your life? I would say even before I changed my tune, there was always a period of no contact of, you know, mm-hmm. having to process it and get over it. I have a lot of thoughts on no contact and we could maybe talk about that after. But <laughs> to wrap this up, piece up, I think my tune has changed because I had like my most serious breakup was an ex that stayed in my life for five years and it was never really platonic like even in a platonic period one of us wanted it to re start. And Mm -hmm. I think it greatly got in the way of me meeting someone else, to be honest. And Mm -hmm. I think like I thought it was okay for a while. And I think that the more if you're fixated on someone else, it's really hard to date with like new people. And like we've had people in our listener community say the same is like, I thought the issue was dating apps, but it turns out I'm still hung up on my ex, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very hard to move forward if that person still lingers in your life. That being said, like I have another other ex that has moved to the UK that we check in here and there. I mean, it's not it wasn't the same emotions either. But that one to me is perfectly fine because it's platonic and it doesn't pass a certain level ever. And it's not someone that I talk to on a regular basis at all. It's maybe like once every six months, if even. So mm-hmm. I think there's distance clearly on that one too, right? It's like just yeah. out of. So I think some of it is circumstantial of like who this person is and how they're affecting you. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I had to be basically end the friendship with my ex because it was getting in the way even of my new relationship. Like, Mm -hmm. so I think there is a point that you realize that you need to move forward. And I think you need to see if it's serving you to have this person here. And again, that I know it's vague to say it's all circumstantial, but I love this, like, what is it that I ultimately want? Do I want to be in a happy, healthy relationship? And is having this person here helping me with that or hurting me with that? Yeah, well, and one thing that can make it complicated is that we tend to think of that other person, um, if we're having a hard time moving past the relationship, we tend to think of them in their idealized state. Always. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right? Yep. If this person were to change this, then we would just be so happy. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe I can just get over this part that bugged the shit out of me when we were together, and then it wouldn't be that big of a deal. And what we're failing to do is really honor what is. This is why I talk about acceptance as that first part of creating a good, good by experience. If you can recognize what's in front of you for what it is without trying to change it, you stop putting your energy into trying to change the past. Mm -hmm. It's done, Mm -hmm. right? And then you can go to that next place of understanding where you're at and where you desire to be. And we've given a a number of examples of how you can go about doing it. But remember that if your doorway, and my friend said this actually, my my ex, who's one of my, my best friends now, he said, if your doorway is filled with energies that are not at the vibration that you desire, okay? And not you can't think of the future vibration, their idealized self. It's who they currently are now, what they're bringing to you energetically. If you've got a doorway full of the energies that are not aligned with the energy you are at, the energies that are right for you cannot come to you. Mm-hmm. So you got to clear the doorway. Right. Right. And one doorway. way to do this, just be mindful that it doesn't have to mean a severe ending. It doesn't have to be that steel door closing down around you. I created something called the Good Goodbye Ritual as a way to help people clear the energetic buildup, the gunk that's in you. So, and you know, symbolically clear that doorway from an energy perspective mm-hmm. through a beautiful and simple ritual mm. where you can come to a deeper sense of understanding about what happened and find more of an acceptance of uh, that, that you can integrate into your narrative of the breakup. Mm-hmm. Because it's the narrative that you're playing in their head that screws you over or keeps Always. you tied to the past or holding on, right? Right. Always. So the good goodbye ritual is a way to be able to honor what happened as a rite of passage. And through this energetic cleanse and release, be able to come out of the other side clear internally so that you can make better choices, that you can actually think more objectively about what you desire as that next step. And this is a ritual that I've done through majority of my breakups. This is a ritual that I will do anytime I'm going through a transition or change. And you guys, it doesn't have to be a difficult one. Mm-hmm. Sometimes breakups, I actually have a dear friend of mine that's going through a breakup and him and his partner are, are doing this 
this breakup in such a beautiful, beautiful, intentional way. They're doing it through a lens of love. Mm. They're communicating throughout it all. They are, they're processing their feelings together and they are also expanding into their own new chapter in a way that is actually recognizing even more that their time together only allowed for a certain amount of expansion as a couple, and now they're expanding individually. But their way of creating this rite of passage allows them to soften into seeing breakups, not as something that has to be painful, ugly, angering, mm-hmm. or you know, shame-filled, but rather a breakup can be a beautiful transition into a new threshold of expansion that you can do together with somebody. Right. And the ritual that I created allows you to do it on your own or with someone to be able to really ease up a lot of that that chunkiness that can get hard. And just if clean out your energetic pipes, because that's often what we don't know how to do. That's such a beautiful way of explaining or describing a breakup too, because we often think breakups need to be nasty. If mm-hmm. it's not nasty, mm-hmm. there's something wrong with that, right? Right. So we can <laughs> even shift the verbiage we use yep. around breakups and how we want to describe them. But If that is the case and we do have this beautiful breakup and we're doing all the self-work, when do we know we're actually ready to date again? Yeah. Mm, How do we know? That's a great question. Well, how how have you known in the past? A lot of mistakes. (laughs) I mean, I think for me, I've definitely gone on dates and realized I wasn't. Like I remember coming out of a date like crying and it had nothing to do with the person I was with Aww. on the date. And mm. I think they're also on the other's flip side, like after my last breakup. I took time to myself. I dated a little and felt like I was okay with it, but not super excited to be meeting new people. So kind of paused again. And then there was this day I just, I don't know what happened, but you just magically hit this day of like, I'm ready to meet people again. And it's hard to say like what that is. But I think for me, it was better to wait to that day than to start trying to push to meet people when I wasn't there. And I think sometimes it's tempting because you're like, I don't want to lose time. I think especially for me after a second breakup, the first one I had spent so much time like ruminating about it that I was like, I want to get back out there and not lose any time. Mm -hmm. And that kind of just like came back to bite me, I thought. Yeah, I thank you both for being so honest around it. And I'll share something, a revelation that I had several months ago this year. Uh, Because I see everything in the world through the lens of energy. Okay. And, you know, my own podcast, Time Out with Gladys and Ula, we talk about the one topic that nobody wants to talk about, which is death. Mm -hmm. And not just physical death, but the metaphorical death, which happens anytime there is a relationship ending, anytime Mm -hmm. that you have an illness and you recover, anytime the world changes and all of a sudden you're on lockdown and then you got to go back (laughs) up. It's all about change because if you go through the layers of any loss or change that you experience in life, the reason we're so terrified of it or we struggle so much is because it's connected by a thread to our perception of death. Mm. Mm. Now, if we see death, right, as as nothing more than a shift in our state of being, um, and we see death as a continuation of energy, because we're infinite beings, energetically, we don't stop existing. We might not exist in a human body, but our energy state continues on. And if you look at anybody that has gone through a near-death experience, which is what Ula has gone through. So mm. she died when she was 23. She's now 50, oh, I might have, yeah, she's just 23 when she died. Um, and she came back to life after 20 minutes of being pronounced clinically wow. dead. Oh, hospital. what a wild story. Yeah. And she's now 51. Okay. So anybody that's gone to the other side always talks about how amazing it is and how love-filled it is and celebratory and joyful and all these amazing words, right, that are just just pure love, we don't have to die to experience that inner life now. So earlier this year, I was reflecting on, on my readiness mm-hmm. to enter into a relationship because it's been a couple of years since my last relationship with my ex that is friends with all his exes that I swore I would never be friends with. He's now my <laughs> best friend. And I asked myself, if everything is energy, And if we attract according to our vibrational state, so wherever my vibrational state is at, that is that same vibrational state that I'm going to attract back. What's my vibrational state around relationships? Mm. And you guys, my heart sunk immediately because I realized I have been afraid to go back into a relationship because like you said earlier, Julie, I'm afraid I'm going to fuck it up because I've had so many relationships and none of them have quote unquote worked worked out. And I had to do some energetic cleanup, good goodbye ritual stuff there. 
to just let go of that narrative and to remind myself I didn't do anything to fuck anything up. Right. Every relationship has served. So if my energetic state around relationships has been fearful, then I'm not going to attract a relationship because I'm fearful. Right. But if I can change my energetic state to excited, curious, mm-hmm. open, you guys, next time we get on this podcast together, I'm going to tell you that I met my love. Yes. You know, like, uh, we, we welcome that opportunity. I love it. <laughs> we will be receiving emails yes, after this. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. I <laughs> so I know I brought this up earlier, but I have this very mixed feeling of the no contact period. Mm. I feel like, you know, it has helped me separate from the person, but then you also mentioned that it actually can help to work it through with someone. And then mm. also the other side of no contact, I feel like so many of us do it as a means to an end. Like mm. if I do it for a month, then they'll contact me because they'll mm-hmm. miss me so much. I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on the no contact and if that's a tactic that helps or hurts or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I love that question. I want to ask you to ask yourself, what do I envision my ideal breakup looking like? When we are in the midst of a breakup, again, we have a tendency to focus so much on the external, on the other person to avoid the opportunity, the invitations to go inward. Mm -hmm. So empower yourself by remembering you're a creator and ask yourself, okay, I'm going through this ending. What's the ideal version of how this ending can go? How would it feel amazing to me to to transition through this and to Mm. get on the other side and feel incredible about the experience? If your response is focused on, well, if that other person does this, or if they apologize to me for that, or if they come back, you're not, you're not really taking this question within you. Mm. How do I envision this ideal breakup looking like? Then you start there. If your ideal breakup involves contact with that other person, just be mindful that you are not in control of the other person's response to you right. staying in contact or their reactions at any moment in that period of continued contact. If your ideal breakup involves a period of no contact, remember that you do not control the other person's response Mm -hmm. to your no contact or any reactions that they're going to have in between. You can only control your response. And this is why I continually go back to it's so important to do that part of calibrating your nervous system so that you can entertain that question from a mental state of clarity. Mm -hmm. And if you see yourself And you got to be really honest with yourself. You know, if you're in that space of like, okay, I'm not going to contact them for the next week because it's just too much. But inside secretly you're like, and then they'll miss me and maybe they'll reach out to me. Yeah. Right? Like I love the honesty um, that you guys have created on this platform because that's the real stuff people are are dealing with. You got to be honest with yourself. Is that the best version of the breakup that I want to go through or is that a manipulative tactic that I'm using? Right? right? And then why might I be trying to manipulate the situation? What am I needing in this moment? And is this benefiting me mm-hmm. right now? So these questions that I've been sharing with you all today are important questions that you can write down and reflect on. And you can even use them as journal prompts. Um, okay. A lot of times when we take the time to just focus inward and do some writing, we can even do painting. It, sometimes it can be walking and just reflecting on these questions. That can allow you to come from a place of clarity. So no contact with your ex for a period of time can become something very clear to you that you may or may not need. Yep. And then you get to revisit it every single day as needed because there is no prescription that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. But there is one reality is that you are creating the experience right now because you are a creator. And that means you get to create the breakup experience that you will have, Mm. right? And you are in full control of the narrative that you're writing right now. And if that narrative, you've been given free reign to that narrative being written in whatever scattered way that it is being written right now, that narrative will define the lens that you carry with you into that next relationship. So you got to own your story around this. 
and create the story that's most going to empower you. That really sums up all of my takeaways in one. I think first and foremost is we are in control of our lives and our story, and we cannot control other people's actions. So in a time of grief and breakups, we can only look within and think about what can I do for myself right now and see myself as that wounded three-year-old vulnerable kid who needs the help first before thinking, well, I need to show my ex that I'm worth it yeah. or I need to get them back. But we can't control these external actions. The second takeaway I have, and I love this so much because my mom has said this to me many times. She said, you would never do anything if you were always afraid of it ending. And so, mm. you know, this is sort of a, my fear around marriage, my fear around relationships. She's like, why would anybody get into anything if they were scared of it ending? But on the flip side of this is we experience endings and beginnings every day. The day ends mm -hmm. and a new day begins. Mm -hmm. And we no longer fear that because we've come to normalize the ending and the beginning that we experience on a daily basis. So the fact that you're encouraging us to focus on the ending, to create create the ideal ending and to remove the novelty around the ending, I think it somehow removes the fear mm. and it makes it normalized that things do end and I yeah. can't not start something because things could end because things could end any day and sometimes without warning. The very last takeaway I have for, for, from all of this is that many a times we, when it comes to relationships and when it comes to the ending of relationships, we do have so much blame on us and on others. And the blame is always like this unfinished sentence. It's like, well, I could have tried harder or he could have done better. She could have done this. And coming to acceptance, and I love that you start with acceptance. Coming to accept the reality of the ending is first and foremost most important in removing that blame. Yeah. And relationships can be very seasonal. Sometimes they end without anybody's fault. It just, you come in and out of each other's seasons. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's okay to see that and to lift the veil on that. So thank you for all those words of encouragement and uh, inspiration. I think this applies to everything else in life too. And something you said really resonated with me, Gladys, is that your life on other areas of your life, you could be high vibing on all of them. But if you check into one specific area and you realize that your vibes aren't up to par with the rest of it, that's very telling. Sometimes we feel like everything's going well because we're seeing the other areas, but there are mm -hmm. some areas that we're abandoning too. So it's yeah. good to check in on all areas of your life every once in a while. So Julie, what are your takeaways? I think my biggest takeaway is that, you know, it sounds cliche, but like every end of a chapter is the beginning of mm. the next. Yeah. And I think when we're really in the thick of things, it's hard to see that, that everything makes room for something that serves us better if we allow it to. And how do we like remember and look at our own life experiences? I think a lot of us, I know for me, this has been the case is every partner I've had has built on and become more serious. And I've learned more about myself and I've operated different in relationships. Mm -hmm. So instead of seeing things like as I'm never going to find someone again, how yeah. can you look at it as like a building block? to where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I think my other big takeaway is how can I make this about me opposed to the other yep. person? I think when we break up and we lose something, and I'll put lose in quotes, I feel like so often we're focused on how do we get that other person back instead of thinking like, is this actually what I want? Was this actually serving mm. me? And I think when we can reframe it to ourselves, and I love all the stuff that you said, Gladys, about just like, how can we, like relationships reflect back our own stuff, basically. Mm. And how can we look at it that way? And how am I growing from this? How am I getting more clear on my needs? Then it turns it into a positive experience opposed to this is what someone took away from me. It doesn't mean that we have to forget the bad feelings. I think that's not realistic mm -hmm. to say that there won't be any hurt or anger or whatever emotion that's unpleasant you can insert there. But I think also so taking inventory of what are we actually gaining from this experience is super important to make it not yeah. be like this is all bad and have that fear too. Great. Before we end this episode, Gladys, what are three prompts 
that you would give our listeners today for them to journal or think about just as a wrap up to this episode? Mm. The three that I would start, well, there have been many today, but the three that I would end with, not start with, would be what is your current definition of a goodbye when it comes to breakups? Mm. So just take a moment to define what breakups have currently meant to you up until this point. Secondly, how would you love a breakup to go? Mm. And get really descriptive, not from a place of who's doing what, but how it would feel for you. And get into that feeling as much as possible. A lot of times we focus on the doing and not the the feeling of where we want to go. So write down as detailed as possible what it would feel like for you to go through an ideal breakup. And then lastly, what am I willing to change about my own narrative Mm. around breakups today to allow for a good goodbye experience? I love that. I hope people are taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, you can always get Gladys's book, The Good Goodbye. I'm guessing anywhere books are sold. Yep. You can find it on Amazon online. And for those that are interested in also learning about the Reset Remedy or The Good Goodbye Ritual, um, you can learn more at my website, which is drgladysauto.com. And if you want, I can include a little link to that. That's wonderful. We'll, We'll have it all in our show notes. Thank you so much, Gladys, for being on our show. I'm glad that it took us two years, but it was so worth it. (laughs) And a lot has happened in those two years. So we had a much more in-depth conversation this time as well. Okay, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Stay dateable. dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. It takes a lot of ingredients to fix or build a car, like cooking, but without the frozen dinner easy way out. eBay Motors has 122 million parts. It's always the right fitment, so you can follow any recipe to a T. Whether it's a vintage Italian coupe that's classic like grandma's meatballs or a German luxury car that's as complicated as almost Roulotten. To cook up something great in the garage, use the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Holidays are here, and so is fashionable fitness. Gift yourself a Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G, a phone that folds in half to literally stand on its own. Pair it with the Galaxy Watch 4 for ultimate wellness and wow factor. Check health stats, flex personal records. Over 90 activities can be tracked, like biking, swimming, golfing, and more. Invest in yourself with tech made to crush goals. Holidays open up with Galaxy. Shop it all at Samsung.com. 5G connection and availability may vary. Check with Carrier. Products sold separately.